A very, very good morning to all of you. Thank you so much for coming. It is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Katrugi Business School uh, to the second virtual lecture from Leading Behind the Mask. Our goal today, it's like uh, trying to actually take you through these difficult times, uh, try to make some sense out of it and prepare, hopefully prepare ourselves for the new normal. And if possible, even get some ideas and not put like uh, opportunities that we may be able to like uh, to find in times like this. Today's session will also serve as a taster for our upcoming leading after crisis program, starting in exactly seven days from now, um, where my my fellow colleagues and myself together with you, we will go deep dive and to figure out what are the things that we can do, you know, how to, how to like, uh, what are the, the, the challenges that we are actually seeing today? What are the, uh, you know, what are the things that could possibly be happening, you know, as a result of the coronavirus, like a pandemic. Now, what we're doing, like uh, with me and Mark today is to actually give you a taster for that. And, uh, you know, like, so stay tuned and make sure you come back to us, you know, Katrugli, in like uh, in the months of April and May. Today, like uh, like uh, the, the session is hosted by me and Mark, my, 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 my friend, colleague, partner in crime, if you like, you know, for those of you who know me, like uh, I like to uh, talk a lot of rubbish. Um, Mark has been around, like uh, I've been working with him for a very, very long time. So it's a great pleasure for me to be working with him again, you know, and holding a webinar today. So Mark, you know, like uh, I will let you first, like uh, say hello to everyone and please, like uh, teach me something. What does it mean by black, white swans, or even gray rhinos? I've got no clue. Tell me. Well, uh, first of all, uh, Terence, thank you for uh, opening this, and I'm actually excited uh, to meet the Katrugli uh, um, crowd. I see many people joining us today, so this is great. Um, the idea behind black, white swans is really uh, try to give um, almost like a metaphor to the current uh, pandemic. Um, I guess more and more people are familiar with the idea of black swans, which we can call this large scale event that tends to be completely unexpected. And they happen by generating a, a major impact or disruption. One very quick example of a black swan can be considered 9-11, for example, where we were not expecting that magnitude of impact. Now, the pandemic could have started maybe in the context of China as a black swan, but by the time that we knew about it, it was for us a white swan. So it was somehow a large scale event, but it was no longer unexpected. We knew this was actually uh, coming. So there is a whole part of the management of the, of, the, uh, of the virus that I think is a different conversation to have not today, which has nonetheless be, uh, become a global uh, dominant effect. The, Additional metaphor on uh, the gray rhinos is really by saying, imagine you're in the middle of, uh, uh, of the jungle and suddenly you see a rhino coming at speed towards you. If you decide to do nothing about it, very likely this rhino will, uh, will run over you. And so we think about the pandemic equally being a gray rhino because we could see it. We could see it coming at the faster speed towards us but we haven't decided to do much. And this is the case of many countries. Uh, we can talk about the UK, we can talk about the US, not only, um, and still countries that have decided to do nothing about it and then decide to catch up with the, the lockdown at a later stage. So I think in this specific case, black uh, and white swans are clear, and gray rhino is an additional animal metaphor to really think about whether we could have done something different about this. And I guess you and I both think we should have, but that's, that's part of maybe the Q&A that will emerge. Terence. Yes, so thank you very much. Like, uh, oh, by the way, guys, um, like uh, everyone here, if you want to actually ask a question, please, please, please use the Q&A box because what we want to do today is to actually have a conversation with all of you. And uh, we do want to actually pick up some questions and answers that you may, you know, like, uh, you know, questions that you may have and even answers, hopefully, you know, coming from, from the audience as well. Now, what we like, uh, you know, in the process of trying to figure out what's going on you know what could be happening in the future we tried like uh we, what we like uh, what we did was we tried to look at different scenarios we're going to show you the scenarios momentarily but first let, like, uh, let us actually have a very very quick visit as to what are the industries that are you know suffering and what are the industry that are actually gaining just to actually have a feel as to where we are today and like uh, you know where would like uh, things would, could be going 
you probably have heard all about this, you know, the travel industry is pretty much dead. Airlines are pretty much gone. Um, hotels reference, like the hotels, conferences, they're all basically just literally come to a, like a screeching halt. And uh, so like for those, you know, like uh, industries, you can see them, they're all basically suffering. And that's why they're all sitting on the left hand side of the, uh, of the, of the, of the graph. Much less probably like affected are the, you know, the, the, those industries that are like a sitting on the fence, like um, education, like uh, insurance, even though we don't know whether the like, insurance will cover pandemic because like uh, apparently insurance companies do not want to cover it, but you know, businesses wants to say that the insurance would cover it, right? Um, uh, utilities, you know, electricity, they are probably making uh, like uh, some money out of people working from home, but at the same time, they're probably losing some money from like uh, the electricity that uh, they would otherwise be like uh, providing to offices. Naturally, there are like, uh, you know, like all crises, there are like uh, gainers, there are winners, and the winners are all like uh, sitting on the right hand side of the, uh, of the graph. Now, um, like a uh, food delivery, you know, restaurants are closed. Um, so, you know, like uh, whoever is like, delivering the food or like uh, websites that are actually in this business they were doing quite well gaming apparently lots of people are actually spending time on gaming which i think is a bad idea but hey you know what if you are staying at home for too long you probably like uh you know later you you probably go crazy so between going crazy by boredom or going crazy by gaming probably the latter it's a uh, it's a easy it's an easier way to actually like uh, get out of the situation um, supermarkets, you know, like, uh, you know, toilet papers, like, uh, you know, we're all still f like uh, fighting for it. If you were not that, it would be pasta. Uh, but, you know, like uh, video conferencing, um, co-working, like Slack and, and like a Microsoft team, they're all doing quite well. Um, what you like, uh, what we have also seen is that, you know, bankers, they actually make a lot of money, a lot of hedge funds. They are actually betting on the volatility. For those of you who were in five finance class, you know, like uh, you would know that, you know, like uh, what it means by risk is basically volatility and volatility. It's good if you're looking for returns. So there's quite a number of like, uh, you know, bankers, especially on the trading side, they're actually making the money. But on the, uh, you know, on the M&A side, not yet. Why not yet? We'll come back to that. But Mark, have you got anything to add? Thanks, Terence, for this. Well, I think the, the only uh, addition I'd like to make to this is that clearly this equally impact the employability of millions of people. Um, so the world is not going to, to be completely uh, unemployed or displaced, but enough to create a disruption. Just I think when you're looking at a graph like this, you should imagine that like in every major circumstances, some people benefit, some other people do not. What I think is more preoccupying or worrying in this time is that those who are not our historical industry that tend to hire millions of people, think about the hospitality industry altogether, in, including also the, the aviation and transportation. I think if the first or second largest employer in the world, if I'm not mistaken. So it's something that is truly have an impact because those industry have no way to easily recover into any form of, of resilience as much as it would happen, for example, for um, for an online shop or for an educational institution or for any form of platform that can use the internet to support uh, their businesses. That's all I would like to share. But I think um, as parents introduced um, the idea that we wanted to provide you with some food for thought, um, we came with an exercise um, that is uh, uh, mainly called scenario matrix. It's an exercise that has been done extensively in strategy. We have selected a number of forces and we came up with four possible scenarios that we would like to offer to you, mainly as an opportunity for the discussion to trigger. Um, I will cover the first two and then I ask parents to cover the remainder two. So we imagine that some of the possible scenarios out, out, away from the pandemic or many after the pandemic could look like this. The first one on the uh, left top corner, we call it medieval mess. Uh, this is going to be a difficult scenario to deal with. Um, we're dealing primarily with uh, a scenario where we have a major disruption. This is a world in which the economies experience a wide variety of cycle with on and off months. We have massive disruption of business model. They rely on physical contact and absence of broad consumer spending power. Inequality grows as global capital elites pull away from the rest. 
and of course investors as well. And in their population, uh, we see that the localism becomes the, the main rule. We have widespread unemployment and of course poverty rises. This is uh, probably the worst scenario in which a generation of disenfranchised individual ensued. Now, another scenario that we'd like to offer is the one that we call the technoxy triumph. So this scenario in which we have a clear cut between winners and losers. We see Asia as a, as a block winning, but it's a world in which a handful of countries, they manage to suppress the virus and they stimulate the economy at different speeds. Um, but the speed is actually really their new competitive advantage. So they are a country that have clearly learned how to act and, and, and deliver things fast. Uh, those that have a tight rule enforcement and burden sharing are those that go faster. Their approach usually is able to hit the right spots. Um, China's domestic market will fill the vacuum that will be indirectly created by the fact that the US and the EU will go into recession and of course unemployment. So it's really a scenario that is uh, so like uh, with the mixed feelings in which you have winners and losers, but we truly have broken this global uh, hegemony of prosperity that we have seen for quite some time. Terence, what do you think about the remainder two scenarios? Right. So, I mean, so like uh, if you look at, if everyone here looks at the, the axis, right, you know, we, what we could see like uh, is that we basically break down the, the whole idea into two dimensions. One is, you know, how much like, uh, you know, whether the government is helping, you know, like uh, helping out. All right. And, you know, and uh, whether the government, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, like doing, helping out in a sense of bailing out or like uh, in a sense of doing other things. All right. And uh, at the other end is how much people or like how much governments will be coordinating with each other. Now, if you were to actually mishmash these two scenarios together and you, if you look at the lower left hand corner, frugal feudalism, what he's saying is this. Yes, governments are putting in money and like uh, pumping money into businesses, but they're pumping money into big businesses, which is what like uh, many, many companies like uh, governments are actually doing at this point. The problem is that the money that is being pumped into big companies, they ended up helping two groups of like uh, stakeholders in the, uh, in the society. The first one, basically the big companies themselves. And the second one, the asset holders and the capital holders. And the reason is simple because like um, the money that is like, uh, that is going into the big companies, ultimately, yes, the, like uh, some of the money like uh, would go out to paying the salaries of the people, which is great, but salaries, like uh, people would use the salaries to pay for, you know, like uh, utilities and like uh, settle their bills, right? And who actually end up making the money? It is of course, you know, the capital holders, the asset holders. So in this case, what we have seen is, you know, there is a cozy, uh, you know, like collaborations between big companies and government. They are actually working together. And this is the reasons why if you look at the little like a letter, you know, the, the W in the uh, in medieval mass, uh, U as a, like uh, under technocracies, like a uh, triumph, this here is not even the letter because what is this like uh, showing is basically a bathtub. What we are going to see is a long term period of you know, like uh, stagnation and high unemployment because like uh, and, and at the same time, all the all the wealth is accumulated to the, uh, you know, to those who have already got this. In other words, like uh, it's going to be something that we are already seeing, you know, it's just a it's just a more amplified version. And that is like uh, income inequality. So. But the good news on this side is that we are probably going to see a lot more local uh, innovations coming up, more like a frugal, so-called frugal innovations. But these frugal innovations will probably most likely be uh, taking place at a very, very local scene. Flip it to the other side, to the other extreme, you know, what we're seeing like, uh, is like uh, what we're seeing is what we call Renaissance Reloaded. This is probably the best scenario of like uh, of the four. And the reason is simple because like uh, this is where all the governments are like, uh, you know, putting in the right, like uh, putting the money in the right place and not just pumping money into the big businesses. And uh, they are, you know, like uh, governments are showing some sort of coordinated efforts. One of the greatest, uh, you know, regret, I guess, this time around, compared to the financial crisis of 2008, is that governments way back then were actually working together. 
this time around, we are not really seeing a very coordinated effort. If you look, uh, take a look at the EU, right? The fact is this, you know, like uh, the North and the South are still arguing about, you know, whether to in like uh, to, to issue the so-called Corona like a uh, Corona like a uh, bond in order to help out with, uh, you know, with the financing, all the, uh, you know, all the, all the like a uh, stimulation packages for like uh, Italy and Spain. Um, hopefully, you know, we will see like a uh, more co like a uh, governments coordinating together and, uh, you know, governments are basically putting the money in the right place. So. In addition, like uh, so, like these are the, the 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 scenarios we can we can we can see. But what are the patterns? You know, what are the like uh, the the various number of things that we you know like uh, we believe that will be actually be you know like uh, coming up to us. Um, you know, these are the more immediate actions, the immediate things that we'll be observing. We've got eight of them. Um, I'll start with the uh, you know I'll start. Um, first one after tremors. Like you know, the the fact is this: we're still not seeing the end of the the coronavirus, the impact of coronavirus. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we cannot do anything about it. If anything, you know, like uh, there is a need to make sure that you know, like you have got enough cash, and there is like uh, to survive as a business, you probably need to start to take care of the people. Um, the wage, like, uh, you know, the, those people who are actually making wages, they're like, uh, you know, not only their health, but also their, like, uh, their, uh, their well-beings, um, their, like, uh, you know, their, to ensure their economic survivals. So there are lots of things that we need to actually deal with, and, you know, like, uh, but these are all already in front of our eyes. Unavoidable roll-ups. <clears throat> we believe that, you know, going forward, we are going to see a lot of M&A activities kicking in. Like uh, simply because some peop companies would fail, other like uh, others would be loaded with cash. This morning, like uh, you know, like uh, in the Financial Times, it was already reported that the uh, Saudi, like uh, the Saudi like, public investment funds, they have already moved in to snap up a lot of different uh, businesses, buying up shares and equities in different companies already. Decentralized supply chains, I think, like. This time around, we realize that we cannot rely on China as the, you know, like uh, as the holder of the supply chain. So there will be more and more localized, uh, you know, productions and manufacturing. The fact is this, you know, like uh, the like uh, the the wage, the the, the wage uh, cost of wages, like uh, people, like labor in China is already as high as some of the more like uh, some of the part, like uh, some of the the the. Uh, uh, the European countries. So it is not hard to imagine that some of the productions will be actually near short, like will be like a near short or like a bring back to the, uh, to, the to Europe. Hybridized work, no need to actually explain. We're all doing it now. And like, uh, you know, the fact that you're listening in, that means like uh, you must be working from home. I think we'll be using a lot more data uh you know, like uh, and more importantly i think like the, the general public will be a lot more uh, inclined to allow authorities to use data to like uh, to track things um so like uh, we were going to see a big push in terms of data like uh, in in terms of people using data and that explains one of the reasons what one that explains one like uh, one like uh, that goes to one of the reasons why share prices in cloud computing companies is actually on the rise Jump in automation, like, uh, you know, uh, companies are trying to recuperate, uh, you know, from this, like, uh, whole, uh, like, a pandemic. And what happened then is they want to cut costs. So automation is one of the, uh, the keys to that. Solidified uh, platform power. Uh, we are going to see more and more the people using specific platforms. Um, so, you know, like Slack. Or uh, or even Zoom, you know, the one that we're like uh, we're like uh, we're like uh, we're looking at simply because you know it all of a sudden it like uh, everyone needs to dive into using like, uh, like uh, technologies using on like uh, online like uh, apps in order to, to like uh, you know to do to do the work. Last but not least, we're going to see like a lot more localism, not, not least because I think like uh, the rise and rise and rise of nationalism, uh, but also because, um, you know, we know that, you know, we cannot rely on the global supply chain. Uh, and of course, you know, there will be a lot more like, uh, you know, things going virtual, a la what we're doing right now. Mark. So Terence, thank you for having covered at least this, this uh, hypothesis that we have on where <clears throat> we see the current the current uh, um, events uh, lead into immediate um, actions. 
I believe you all see this as being somehow a fundamental uh, teutonic shift in what we consider to be the traditional rule of globalization. I think we all uh, feel that globalization was already walking on a quite um, thin ice because of the increasing amount of nationalism that was uh, politically perpetrated and country looking at themselves before looking at other uh, countries to collaborate. We have seen also before the pandemic more and more tension against the multilateral organizations. And I think the pandemic simply became uh, the straw that brought the camels back, as they say, in which the global structure has been uh, severely compromised. And these are somehow the first wave of uh, events that we tend to see. Um, one of the things that is important for you to consider is that clearly we can only get to see up to a point because we still are in a phase where the trajectories of our decisions um, could actually change the outcome. We could still recover, not necessarily like before, but in a way that would be more resilient. Uh, we could still decrease the impact on the social disenfranchised individual by uh, recovering the employability and keeping them employed during the crisis. Uh, so we can have answers to this problem that might change some of the um, scenario that we have presented, but we fear that that specific kind of energy and response, the muscular response to it has not been seen yet. Uh, so this is why I think we keep on engaging in conversation like this because we, we uh, rely on you to equally have the right conversation at work with your companies or if you're in the, in the public sector with the public uh, uh, officers. I think this is also where we end our uh, relatively short presentation because as Darren said before, uh, the reason why we want to do this is to engage with you and uh, to answer as many questions as possible. Um, so as also Maria mentioned before, please use the Q&A to, uh, uh, to send us your questions and we'll be happy to address them and try to share some of our insights with you. So Terence, should we start the Q&A? Absolutely. Go ahead if you want to. Sure. I think... Um, let me, well, I'll try with the first one, which is, uh, I think it's Atiana asking about agriculture and yeah. problem in labor that is raising. Yeah. Um, so and I think this problem with agriculture has been always there um, because food has, has been, um, food and food security has been, again, on the headlines for quite some time. And the agriculture doesn't generate a lot of our global GDP, but we all somehow need it. Um, and we have been subsidizing agriculture for too long. So I think is, is one of the perfect examples where we did not make it an efficient um, you know, asset class. Um, the idea would be, again, to see whether through technology we can use um, the solution that we currently have to improve the output, uh, also bearing in mind what will be the impact of climate change. So I think the pandemic by itself has simply created even more tension on a quite dysfunctional, uh, let's say, sector. Um, hopefully, um, because of what Terry was saying before, localism will nonetheless prevail. We might be able to discover some form of entrepreneurship in local sites that will also invest into food. Uh, we are hoping that will be more like agri-tech rather than traditional agriculture because of the fact that we can have you know, better results, uh, better uh, impact with the environment and also uh, engage in a community of innovators and, and, and investors that usually do not look at agriculture. So thanks for your question, uh, Atiana. Terence, you would like to take the next one? Uh, yep. So I like uh, before I move on, right? Like uh, one one interesting like uh, observation. Yesterday I read that uh, the UK decided that they like uh, to fly in uh, a plane load of Romanians to come to like uh, to the UK. Uh, you know, like uh, apparently this is this is no, no longer Brexit. There is no longer Brexit issues, right? Uh, and uh, what do they do to actually like uh, make sure that they can like uh, we have got enough labor to actually harvest like uh, like uh, whatever is being grown? You know, this basically tells us that you know, like uh, at the at, on the one hand, people want to talk about nationalism, protectionism. On the other hand, there is you know like uh, a structural issue, and there is a severe shortage of labor. How are we going to balance it? 
we don't know. But I think like I don't think it is, you know, the argument for protectionism is probably not going to be as easy as one thinks like uh, it would be. Right. We're going to like uh, move on to the second questions, and that is, you know, like uh, what are the industries that are going to be the most resilient to like uh, as a consequence of the uh, COVID nineteen crisis? Uh, the uh, the if we were to go with this slide, right, the uh, the slides, I think, you know, going forward, if you are in mask manufacturing, congratulations, I think you are going to make money like uh, nonstop in the years to come. Um, I simply cannot imagine how we can actually go back to our previous life without like, uh, you know, putting a mask on. Um, if you have got a vaccine, congratulations, you know, that would work as well. But I think like, uh, you know, on top of that, right, you know, like, I think there are lots of industries that are going to change for good. Um, I think like, uh, one of the things that, that is, um, that has changed our habit quite substantially is the fact that a lot of, like, a lot of people, you know, like, uh, probably the Italians, you know, I'm not talking about Mark, but, you know, the Italians in general, uh, they all of a sudden, they realize that, hey, you know what, there is something called e-commerce. You can buy things online. Um, I think like, uh, you know, whoever is going into the e-commerce, it's going to actually like, uh, you know, going to do like uh, better. Uh, if you are healthcare, you know, like a medical supplies, you probably be like, uh, you know, have like a be able to make money in the years to come. Mark, have you got anything to add? Yes. So there is the, um, I think one of the, the reflection that I was equally having is that we now are forced to understand the concept of essential workers and essential industries. And I think that's the easiest answer to the question that, that Branco brought up. The essential industry will continue because either because we can or because the government will subsidize or the fact that, for example, a country like Spain is rolling out universal basic income in the next few weeks. Um, we will cover, of course, the essential industry because that's what defines the minimal necessary. But I also make you imagine how many industries that we currently can't tap on uh, because of the lockdown will be most likely impacted in a way in which the estimate is, uh, depending on where you are, but one out of three businesses will never recover. So it shows you that the essential and whatever is mailing the physical production, beside what we see already with the online, the cloud, um, the, uh, of course, the internet provisions, the telco, beside that side that is mainly related to the household, uh, the essential will equally prevail. So that's all I wanted to share. We, we already can, can see now inklings of what it could be somehow and an essential industry that will survive. So maybe what I can do, Terence, is, is uh, kick on the next one. And I yeah, see now there's a number of questions happening. Yeah, so we'll let's try, try to, to cut through them. Yeah, cut through this. Um, so, uh, August, I'll answer your question. Um, well, I, I uh, think there is uh, not much of a difference right now between U.S. and Europe. Um, I think they're both suffering, both continents are suffering of the same problem, which is, of course, uh, uh, a one-side federal government dependency on the national one or the regional one. So there's a little bit of a, a clash between federal or national and regional. It happens in most, most regions. So I don't see much difference. I mean, in the case of China, I can only talk from what I have uh, read. I mean, uh, I think it looks like the country is slowly in trying to regain some form of normalcy. Um, but, you know, I, I always consider that China is a major global player, but it's not a player in the sense that he plays alongside the other ones. He has always been playing its own game. So it's one of the, the if you remember, one of the scenarios that we suggest is that the Asian bloc will eventually prevail. So I think that's the main difference I say this. Um, let me tell you in one sentence, I see the Asian economy having been much more resilient in recovering from this than what I see right now in Europe or in the US. Um, so uh, Terence, do you wanna maybe, should we go to the next the question? We'll go back to, I'll say, um, I presume what Cora you are resume, like are referring to when it comes to immobilia. Uh, a real estate, Terence. Real estate market. Real estate. Two ways you can actually. Uh, I think, I don't know whether it's me, but I think I lost Terence. Actually, look at it. Hear me. I, yeah, yeah Terence, I, I think I lost you for. That's for, okay. 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I think, and maybe um, from the panelists, you guys can tell me uh, whether it's only me or whether you also have lost Terence. Can you just write in the chat just to understand whether it's me or, or Terence? I also lost. Okay. Uh, okay. So I think I can take care of this, uh, guys. I think, uh, Cora, I'll try to answer your question. Um, the real estate, uh, so Marina, I'm not sure if it's gone, but I think it's just uh, this internet connection is gone. Anyway, um, Cora, I think the real estate will suffer because of the fact that um, we will mainly uh, wait before investing into real estate. People will not necessarily take mortgages or they will not sell either because that would be the worst the time to sell. Um, so I think it will be one of those sectors that most likely will be um, will be suffering in the next few uh, years. So hopefully that um, has provided with an answer. I'll take on the question before uh, I can see Terence uh, eventually come back. back. I'm back. Can you you're back. Me? You're back. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So we didn't know whether you simply have been transported uh, listen, to like, different. Uh, don't, don't even go there. Like uh, you know, like uh, it's uh, like uh, technology is working against me. Okay, listen, Terence, I've I taken care of the question with Cora. Um, so let me know whether you would like to take on the next one. Yep, so let me actually... Or any of the question that you see, I mean... You know, uh, like, we... uh, yeah, because like, uh, I, I had to somehow... Okay, so I have got like, in front of me the question from... May I, like, uh, as a mayor, I'm responsible for reallocation of public resources. Ha, huh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, indirect methods. They, you know, as a, as a mayor, right, like uh, I would beg, you know, any government authority to like uh, to do this, you know, make sure that the money is going into the SMEs, the hands of those, you know, like uh, small business enterprises. Uh, yes, it is a lot uh, like uh, less risky to lend money to big companies, but I think like uh, it will be very, very useful to actually lend the money to the small, like a uh, small, medium sized enterprises because they are the one who failed like uh, a lot of the time, or at least going to be very, very difficult and expensive for them to actually raise the money. Um, on top of that, I think one group of people that we do not really talk about is basically the people who actually are still out there who are keeping the world going. You know, those people who are actually doing the delivery, those people who are actually stocking, you know, for our supermarkets. A lot of the time, they're very, very poorly paid and, you know, they have got no protection at all whatsoever, both in terms of social money, monetary or like uh, the actual, you know, like uh, health protections. So I think these like uh, they, they are, you know, there are two very, very vulnerable groups right now. Um, so this is what I would plead to all the government officials. Mark, do you want to take the next question? Yes. So, um... Goran, your question on, on travel and leisure. I mean, I, I don't think I have any good, good answer about that, Goran. I, I do believe that we're going to see this particular sector being impacted. Um, in the local communities, maybe there are ways for the, the staff of, uh, of um, uh, let's say, hospitality venues to uh, recycle their facility for something else or to uh, repurpose them for something else. Um, so I start seeing, again, opportunity for the space that, uh, for example, hotels have to be used for uh, specific social needs that the city or the communities need. And that's a way, of course, to uh, define some form of revenue in time in which you cannot run your traditional activities. Um, you know, the staff in the hospitality are service staff. So their staff, they're working in the service economy, there's significant amount of services that we will need to actually repurpose in the next few months as we try to um, de-escalate the crisis and go back to normal. So maybe a way is to really think in which way uh, there is interoperability between staff that used to work in hospitality in other kind of important service industry. And this is where I think collaboration these days is critical because because we are through a pandemic or a crisis, it doesn't mean we don't need help or support or a workforce. It's just that we don't need it in the traditional sense. So the ability for us to redesign roles is, is important. And, and I think it's a healthy exercise to do anyway. So I hope this was uh, uh, helpful for you, Goran. Uh, Terence. 
So the next question coming from Lubov is, you know, do we, are we going to see the end of shareholders capitalism, right? I very, very much hope so. You know what, well, listen, you know, I, I teach finance. So the only thing I care about, you know, at least in the subject of finance is shareholders capitalism. I do very much hope that, you know, we will be able to, uh, you know, like uh, to spread out and take into account, you know, more stakeholders you know, like, uh, and their general welfare. And like, uh, the, but the problem here is the way, you know, we have been, governments can channel money into the market. Um, it's all still going through like a shareholders capitalism. The fact that a lot of businesses, they're unwilling, unwilling uh, to cut dividends and rather keep the money in the, uh, you know, in the business to pay the wages, to actually keep people employed, you know, is already a sign to me at the very least that there will be some forms of like, uh, you know, oppositions to that. So is there going to be a real shift? I'm not so sure. I do hope that, you know, this is, like, uh, this will be possible. Mark, do you want to take the next one? Yes. Thank you for this. Um, so let me see, Daniela, you're asking, Less than globalization, uh, losing, which is opposite situation, was 2009. Yeah, so then I think it's, it's, it's pretty much the opposite event. I think in 2008, 9, 10, we have truly moved into uh, a global community, a global civilization to be, uh, to be even more, let's say, representative of the idea. Um, and I think we have successfully uh, brought millions of people into the global economy, mainly because of the global supply chains. If you remember, one of the things we were sharing before in the slides is that local supply chains again, or versus a global one, that will clearly mean that we're going to change also the direction of collaboration. Um, it's not necessarily bad per se. I always, my, on a personal level, I always believe that uh, you cannot simply have a global supply chain without having a local one. And we had gone to a point in which we were overly dependent on the global and the local was completely dismantled. So there is some silver lining in all of this. I'm not sure whether it's deglobalization or what somebody calls uh, localization. And this, for me, this is still something I don't know. But I, for sure, we'll see a different trend from what we've seen in 2008 onwards when we really went into the, the, the gist of globalization. So Terence, you want to take the next one? Uh, yeah, M&A. Would there be M&A? There will be tons of M&As. You know, like, uh, if you think about it, right, what is M&A is basically buying companies. Uh, you need two things. One, you need things to buy and you need like a money to buy. And uh, would there be lots of companies to buy? The answer is yes, because lots of companies will be suffering. Uh, they would be running out of cash. Uh, probably the smaller tech firms, you know, they would probably be snapped up quite quickly, especially for those people who have got the money, i.e. the big companies. So we are probably going to see a lot of big companies uh, buying small companies. Where is the money coming from? That's a great question. You know, some companies are going to do very, very well. So they would have like uh, enough equity to do things. Others, which is like, a, you know, like a bordering on like, a, you know, like a, a moral issues, if you like, you know, it's not ethical. It's, you know, can you, should you be using government bailout funds to buy another company? Now, I think that is going to be, a, there, there, is, there will be a debate there. So, Mark, would you like to take yes. the next one? Yes. So, Luca, you're asking about banks. Um, again, I think there are multiple scenarios. One of this will be, of course, bank will suffer because interest rate, as you know, are, in negative territory and who is protect, protecting the bank if the bank decides to lend um, you know so that's a question whether central bank or government will mainly uh, support uh, banks even in the overdraft um, so that the bank doesn't feel it's necessarily losing some banks will take this as an opportunity to go even more in the digital space because of the fact that they need to reduce the fixed cost and going back in the question that Terence answered before imagine a bank acquiring a fintech that will be with the intention of reducing the physical uh, size and trying to run the business as a platform. So I think this could be a possibility. We will still need banks for the financial intermediation. We won't get rid of them. I think they will probably continue the transformation to start already before. I don't find the banks per se have been impacted uh, by this pandemic like they were not expecting. It's just that this pandemic has accelerated within few days what usually happened within years. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's just a feeling that I have on, on this. Terence, I think there's a question from Marco for you. 
Yes, so the uh, question here is, you know, would there be a profit making niche for, for banks? The answer is yes, you know, investment banks, uh, they are making like a trading part, they're making money already, they have been making apparently more like a record profits, uh, hedge funds making record profits, uh, but the investment banking side is pretty much dead because if the clients are not in the office and they are not in the mood to buy things, there is no market to be had. Having said that, going forward, I think that M&A activities will pick up substantially. Regarding the regular banks, you know, I think like uh, banks are like uh, in a very delicate situations right now. You know, for the first time in history, they c we cannot blame them for any crisis that for the crisis we are actually seeing. Uh, the question is, you know, the the moment that they take the money from the government. Uh, should they be lending it out? If they lend it out, you know, like uh, they are doing a good, like a, you know, great service because that's what the government expect them to do. But what happened if they were to lend out to those companies that are actually like a very poor in credit and they cannot pay back? So for the banks, it is a very, very like, uh, you know, difficult situations. And we are going to, you know, like we're going to see how banks survive, you know, like, um, you know, what they would do. It all depends, as people would say, like it all depends on how the GDP, you know, would be shaped. You know, is it going to be a W? Is it going to be a U? Or is it going to be a bathtub? It all depends. So, Mark, why don't I let you take yes. the next one, given that yes. we have got three minutes. Yes. So, Judith, uh, briefly, I think oil and gas has suffered uh, in this crisis. Uh, I never thought that I could see something lower than uh, January 2016 when the oil was traded at $33, but I have. Uh, we were in the twenties dollars, something like this. Um, and I think if we are going to decrease the global supply chain to more local one, naturally in the mobility also materials and goods, we will see a decrease equally in the number of flights we will see uh, on in the skies. If we're also going to reduce, let's say, by 30 percent the previous capacity, then you have a 30 percent less demand for oil and gas. And I think it's likely to believe that this industry will continue to contract uh, because it's somehow proportional to how much we expand it through both the movement of people and, and goods. Um, again, you can try to say we, you, we can still have dependency on this because we still haven't, uh, you know, relayed directly to renewables. But that dependency doesn't change the fact that the, the demand for it has decreased. So, um, Terence, would you like to take the one, the following one? Yes, I would take. I think like uh, I think we like uh, this probably is the one of the last two uh, questions. Shall we do that? Um, so these questions rely on like uh, you know how do you actually like uh, do scenarios and uh, future trends you know with reliable data. That's a very good question. The way like uh, we do it is like uh, first you know we cannot emphasize you know like uh, stress the importance of doing scenarios now because nobody knows what's going on uh, you know like we don't know what the uh, you know what the future would be like and this makes the like it makes you far like uh, ever more important to try to have a view as to what could actually be happening now for like uh, you know if for sure what is going to happen how the how the future is going to unfold is not going to land exactly on what we're preparing but it will be, you know, somewhere in between. And the key is to actually get our thinkings together already. It is going to be very, very difficult to do a, like a, a bottom up exercise. So the way, the right way to do it, you know, it's to pick the macroeconomic data that is going, that is the most relevant to your company. And then you are going to pick the, like the most important macroeconomic data that is relevant to you and then try to actually use them to feed into the calculations of various things, you know, like uh, your, how is it going to impact your like uh, profit positions? How is it going to impact your cash positions? How is it going to impact your value chain? Like a different, like uh, all sorts of things. Now, naturally, we can't, I can't, you know, like I share with you the entire methodology here over like, uh, you know, online. But, you know, I think that's, the, you know, that's already the, the right start to, uh, you know, figuring out where your company can actually be going. Mark, would you like to take the, uh, the last question? Yes. So Imola, again on the scenario, and so actually I'll share, if you remember the four scenarios, and Terence, maybe if you can just bring uh, me back to the four scenarios. Yeah. Um, so the one that we currently see happening right now is the one on the technocracy one and the one on frugal feudalism. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, you know, currently we are experiencing that, and currently we're experiencing this, this winning-losing so like paradigm where some country managed this, um, even in Europe, their country, they have been able to control it much better than others. 
um, and other countries that truly struggle. Um, we can see some states inside of the U.S. that have managed better than others. Uh, and you can say that these two scenarios are somehow what we see happening right now. Now, if you remember what Terence mentioned about the geometries of the shapes, so we have a bathtub and we have a V. These are still scenarios where we have a recovery mechanism because yeah. in frugal federalism, somehow we simply have to find a way to normalize it to a point in which we can again bounce back. And in the V shape, uh, we have to figure out whether the winners can actually help the loser to eventually catch up. Uh, what we haven't seen yet is the medieval and the renaissance uh, and therefore it shows you most likely that we are in the midway on what could become one or the other um, and so I'm hoping with your question Imola that we're going to be able you know to recover from this um, in a way that we will have really move our economies to a much more resilient format because be reassured that pandemic is just a rookie in comparison to what is ahead of us. Mm -hmm. This is almost like dress rehearsal. Yeah. We still yeah. are up for a number of different systemic crises happening yeah. by the nature of how we are. So if yeah. we manage this right, I think we're going to be able to really think that systemic crisis, we will have found a mechanism to become resilient. If we can't cope with this, I think our institutional framework were too fragile to ever survive any shock of this magnitude. And this is, I think, where, at times, we should probably end the Q&A.